All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Stephen. I'm the pastor here at Kingsway. It's awesome to be with you all this morning and with all our kids as well. Um, hello. It's good to have you. Um, yeah, Leon did a great job. Um, I'm not. I don't have any nice pictures and nice games for us to play. So hopefully, you know, you all participated in your minds at least in the game. So um, I don't have to do. I'll do the boring stuff. Leon did all the fun stuff. Um, and also, I just wanted to add, so Henry, who is leading the service, is uh, he's going on a holiday for a month or so, so um, we won't see him for a good month, and Mina as well. I don't see Mina. Oh, she's upstairs, okay. So make sure you say bye to them and, and um, pray for them that they would have a safe trip. One of the places that they're going to is Japan, I believe. And um, I know this doesn't really link, but Japan has a lot of martial arts, um, one of the martial arts that they do is jiu-jitsu, right? At, at the moment, Brazilian jiu-jitsu is um, a really popular sort of sport, right? I know there's a couple of dads in our congregation who, who practice and, and train in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, and, I, and I have a lot of respect for you guys uh, because, personally, a sport like jiu-jitsu, um, where you're wrestling and, you know, it's a little bit too... <laughs> it's a little bit too intimate for me. Uh, it's a little bit too, you know, close up and personal. Um, you know, just the thought of, you know, me being sweaty and there's another sweaty person and their bum is like sitting on my face and, you know, my armpits in up their nose or something like that. Like, that's just, it's not really my thing. Um, and not only that, I'll be honest, look, as you can tell, I'm not like a peak physical specimen. I'm, I'm not much of a fighter. I'm, I'm not really, you know... Uh, my, my strength isn't in my strength, um, so, <laughs> so I, I have a lot of respect for people who, you know, are in those sort of physical sports um, and, and train and wrestle and all those things, and I have even more respect, especially after reading today's passage, that Paul is describing for us uh, that, that every Christian is in a sort of battle, in a struggle, in a fight, um, in a wrestling match, and, and it's really that the fight is up close and personal. Um, our, our fight as Christians is real, it's tough, it's close quarters, it, it's not sort of just happening over there and, and we can, you know, just watch, watch it from afar. A, a Christian's struggle and battle is real and in our face. And, and with any wrestling match, any, any match that involves this sort of struggle, um, the one who takes home the victory is the one who stands, right? The one who remains standing when the final whistle blows. See, Paul has been calling on Christians to live a life worthy of the gospel. That, that's how he started chapter 4, uh, the second half of the letter. In the first three chapters, he explained the gospel. And then from chapter 4, he tried to apply the gospel to say, look, this is, it, it, now that you've heard the gospel, now that you know that you're in Jesus, here's he's he's how to live a life worthy of your calling. You should live a life that's no longer futile and darkened and separated from God, but you, you need to live a life that's made new in Jesus. And, and the final instruction with, with all of that, that Paul leaves to the church is for them, in light of this new life that they have, in light of this calling that they have in Jesus, he tells them to stand strong in God. Stand strong in God. And in a way, that I think that's, that's really what our Christian life boils down to. When it all comes to an end, at the end of the day, at the end of our lives, when the final whistle blows, will we be found standing in the strength of the Lord, or not. So Paul has four things to tell us today. Four things to tell us about standing strong in the Lord. And, and um, to stand strong in the Lord, we need to discern our struggle. We need to put on our strength. We need to follow the strategy. And finally, we need to rest in the Savior. So four things, discern our struggle, put on our strength, follow the strategy, and rest in the Savior. So we're going to go through those four points. I'm going to pray um, and come to God's Word. Lord, as we yeah, consider this final command and instruction by Paul to stand strong in the Lord and in, and in your mighty power, 
Uh, help us to understand. Help us to understand what is our struggle. Uh, what is the strength that we've been given? And, and what do you call us to do? And, and finally, really, how, where do you call us to find our rest in? Um, we want to be able to understand and know and therefore live out this command to be strong in you. So be, please be with us. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Paul starts by saying this. He says, Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. See, Paul tells us that there's a struggle that's going on inside each one of us right now. There's a spiritual struggle that's happening, for a, a struggle um, for the, the desires and affections of our souls. Uh, one side tries to destroy those affections so that uh, it destroys our faith. It, it damages it. It takes us away from God. And, and the other side of the struggle is for us to stand strong. And to figure out how to actually take a stand, we first need to discern the struggle. And so I want to start by warning you, giving us some warnings from this passage uh, about how the devil actually schemes to deceive us in our struggles, in this spiritual battle, to confuse us and to really um, sort of trick us into believing that we're okay, that, that the war, that the struggle isn't as bad as Paul says it is. See, the first thing that the devil schemes is to make us believe that there is no spiritual war, that there is no spiritual war. See, for many of us, you know, talking about the devil and spiritual forces and, you know, these powers of evil that are work and these cosmic things, it can sound a bit too supernatural. It's a bit, you know, like... I don't really feel that, there's, and, you know, and there's, there's a good reason to not be obsessed about demons and devils and things like that, but the Bible doesn't allow us to ignore that there really are evil spiritual forces and powers that are at work today and even in our own lives. And, and, and like I said, you might say, Look, but Stephen, I don't feel a great spiritual attack. I don't, I'm not having these scary nightmares. I'm not having visions of you know, whatever, I, I, I don't feel a great evil influence in my life. In fact, you might say, actually, everything seems quite okay in my life. Uh, there's, there's no real issues with my marriage. There's no big issues with my children. I don't feel great persecution. I don't even feel great suffering. Um, how, do I, how can you say that there's this great spiritual cosmic battle that's happening in the world and in my life? And if, if that's what you're thinking... There's no real battle. It's just, it's not that bad. Um, you know, could it be that the devil is lulling us into a false sense of security that we do drift and we do sort of coast, that, that we, don't, we don't really think about the battle until it's too late? You know, it might not always feel like we're fighting great big spiritual battles every single day. Well, so, for some of us, we might, but, but for many of us, it might not feel that way. But the truth is, we actually do fight, even if we don't, we're not fighting big spiritual battles every day, we actually fight a thousand little battles every single day. A thousand little battles that, that are competing for, uh, in our hearts and in our souls for whether we'd stand strong in the Lord or we'd buckle and we'd go back to our old lives. And, and all those little battles add up. You know, you have a you have a you have a hundred little battles today, you have a hundred little battles tomorrow, and as the days become weeks and months and years, until maybe that one day comes, one day of evil where where you suddenly need to figure out how to how to cope with that death in your life, or, or you, you have to, you're in a position to, to choose whether you, you, you're going to cheat on your spouse or not, or, or you have to, uh, you're, you're facing this great ridicule and, and persecution on behalf uh, uh, because of the fact that you're a Christian, and when, when all those little things add up and you face 
that one big moment, you might actually find that you've never figured how to fight the big battles because you've never taken the little one seriously. See, no one falls into great sin in one go. No one gambles away their house on their first bet. No one cheats on their partner with the first person they see on the street with a great body. No one sins, no one does great big sin on the first go. In every conversation, in every word, in every decision, in every react, in every emotion, in every insignificant and forgettable moment of life, there's actually a battle going on. A mini battle that either brings you closer to God to stand in Jesus and in His light or that succumbs to the schemes of the devil. Okay? So the first slide, there's no spiritual war, things seem fine, but actually that's not true. Here's another way we can get the Christian walk messed up. The devil makes us believe that our struggle is not spiritual, but against people. So you think about all the different contexts that Paul has been applying this new life in Jesus to. You know, the, we've been doing this the, the past couple of weeks in the book of Ephesians. He's talked about Jews versus Gentiles. He's talked about husbands and wives. He's talked about children and parents. He's talked about slaves and masters. Each of these are relationships that, have, that create conflict, that can create this sort of separation and division. Um, but in all of those relational contexts, Paul says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of the dark world, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul is saying, You're our enemy isn't really actually the physical things. The real enemy, let's say, of our lust isn't men or women, right? The, the real enemy of our greed in cheating our taxes, it, it's not the government that makes loopholes, it's not your tax account. The real enemy of our anger isn't that one person who pushes your buttons. The real enemy of sin is spiritual. The real enemy is the lies of our old self. The real enemy is the way that our souls desire to follow the ways of this world and, and the rule of the kingdom of the air and to satisfy our cravings in the flesh. The real enemy is the scheme of the devil that seeks to undermine and enfeeble the life-giving work of the gospel. He, 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 he makes it superficial. He, he schemes to not allow the gospel to go deep into our lives, into our hearts, to, to not allow the gospel to change our identity to the point where we are different, where we realize that we... we we have a new life that we're putting off our old self. Our fight isn't against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil. And the third lie is that the devil tells us that we don't need God to be our strength. And this, this is our second point. We need to put on strength. But the essence of the devil's deception is... is that it, he tells us that we don't need God to be strong. To reject God is essentially to say, I don't need God to be strong because I don't need God to tell me that I'm a sinner. I don't need God to tell me that I'm forgiven. I don't need God to tell me about my past and my future, and therefore I don't need God to tell me how to live my life in the present. The lie is that we don't need God to be strong. And that lie is not only about people who reject God as non-Christians and, 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 and so anti-religious, but it's actually the same lie that applies to Christians or to so-called Christians and to false religion. Because false religion tells us that if I can be strong enough in myself, if I can be moral enough, good enough, if I can do just, just, just do enough religious and spiritual things and Christian things, then God will accept me. It's essentially saying, I don't need God to be accepted by God. I just need to be good. But Paul says, both of those are wrong. He says, be strong in the Lord 
and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. That's how we take a stand. It's not by putting on a new version of ourselves or a better Stephen. We have to be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. In the original language, the command to be strong isn't, isn't literally be strong. It's actually literally be strengthened. It, it's something that happens to us, not something we do. Um, be strengthened in the Lord and in His mighty power. Paul uses the, this metaphor of putting on the armor of God to help us understand what it means to be strengthened in the Lord. He says this, verse 14, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate, breastplate of righteousness. And it's amazing that uh, Leon <laughs> said aprons are breastplates. Now I have a whole new view of what cooking really is. Uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a real battle. The breastplate of righteousness your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit. See, Paul lists at least seven items here to make up this full armor of God. Um, you have the, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, boots of peace, shield of faith, helmet of salvation, sword of the Spirit. Um, and the key to understanding what Paul is talking about here with this armor, armor metaphor is to recognize that all of the things that Paul lists here have one thing in common. The thing that all of these items have in common is that every single one of these things are things that have already been given to Christians. Every single one of these items, every single one of these items that make up the full armor of God is a piece of armor that has already been given to Christians in Jesus because all of these items are simply elements of the gospel. Now, Paul has actually talked about pretty much every single piece of armor here throughout the book of Ephesians already. He's talked about the message of truth in Ephesians chapter 1. The message of truth, the gospel uh, that brings salvation, the gospel, the, the truth that holds us together in Jesus. He's spoken already about the righteousness of Jesus. Uh, the righteousness of Jesus protects us from the devil, devil's accusations of guilt. We are called into Christ's righteousness so that we can stand and not be condemned. Christ's righteousness is freely given to us. He's spoken about the peace that comes with the gospel as well. Jesus himself, Paul said, is the peace who reconciles us with God and with each other. And because Jesus is our peace, we are ready to share that peace with others. He's spoken about faith as well. He's spoken about the faith that we've been saved with. We've been saved by faith, not by works so that no one may boast. Through faith in Jesus, we approach God with freedom and confidence. We have salvation as an helmet that assures us that we truly do belong to Christ, that we are sealed in the Spirit. But the reason why Paul goes through all of these things again at the end to say, look, you need to put on the armor. You need to put on, like, I've, I know I've spent six chapters talking about all of these things, but I need you to put on the armor. And the reason why he does that is because there's a difference between talking about this gospel and knowing about the gospel and putting on the gospel. There's a massive difference between talking about the gospel, knowing the gospel, and putting on the gospel. There's a difference between talking about Jesus and, and knowing things about Jesus and putting on Jesus. Armor is useless unless you put it on every single day. See, to put on the armor of God is to take the gospel that tells us that we are fully known and loved and redeemed by God. He loved us before the world began, before we could do anything. He, lo he already loved us. He secured our salvation for eternity based on His grace, and God never goes back on His word. The, to put on the armor of God is to take the gospel that tells us we are our identities, have been completely made new because we've been united to Jesus in His death and in His resurrection. And He's brought us to be a part of His 
eternal and cosmic plan to bring all things under the authority of Jesus. He's brought us into His church to be part of His body, to be growing, to be speaking the truth in love to each other, to be, bu- to be bu- uh, built up into maturity and unity. You know, only when those truths become like armor to us, when we put it on every single day, only when those truths are, are so infused with who we are in the, the very deepest parts of our souls, in what we think and what we really believe in our hearts, when adversity comes, when suffering comes, when temptation comes, when the devil attacks, in every moment that we might have used to have a knee-jerk reaction where we would just follow the ways of the world or, or we would lash out in anger or we would, um, you know, we would just... We would satisfy the cravings of our flesh. We would, we would be easily divided. We wouldn't care so much about peace. Uh, we wouldn't care so much about unity. We would have fear and guilt, and, and the lies and the schemes of the devil would be effective against us. It, instead of having those sort of knee-jerk reactions, when the gospel, when we put on the gospel, when we put on Jesus, we start to think and talk and act like people who really do have Jesus. People who have absolute confidence that in Jesus, God does love me. Uh, that, that, that Satan can't take away God's love for me. That we, I, I'm saved, but I'm saved by grace through faith. And, and because I can't boast in my works, because I didn't save myself by my works, then therefore I can't unsave myself by my works either. But it also tells us that because I am new, look at this amazing love that I have in Jesus and this amazing calling that I have to be righteous and to be holy because my God is righteous and holy, it just, that's what it means to put on the full armor of God. You, there's no, you go from being sort of automatically reacting to the schemes and, and falling into sin and despair and, and temptation to when the same attacks come, you, you, you're like, wait a minute, that's just not me. I, I've put on Jesus. Do we live and respond to all the different schemes and lies that the devil throws at us from the smallest moments of our life? The the first thing you think about when you wake up, the last thing you think about before you go to bed, the way that you react when your child is uh, is disobedient, the way you react to your parents who who annoy you, uh, uh, the way you treat people, the, the way you control or not control your anger, the way you spend your free time, the things you think about. Do you live in light of the fact that you are no longer dead in sin, but alive in Christ? The only way to live in the light of that is to put on Jesus, to put on the full armor of God in the gospel, every single day. How do we do that? Well, here's the strategy. The strategy or the practical application of putting on the armor of God boils down to really two basic principles, two basic things, and that's the Bible and prayer. It's the Bible and prayer. I know it sounds generic, but it it is. Look, this is what he says. He says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit. On all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray for me, Paul says, so that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in prayer. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly. And he says, Tychicus, my dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, he'll tell you everything that you also may know how I am, what I'm doing. I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and sisters. Love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And grace to all who love our Lord Jesus with an undying love. See, spiritual warfare. To stand strong in the power of God means putting on the full armor of God, worn by Christ and expressing it through a devotion to the Word of God 
and prayer. We need the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the Bible and its truths, to cut through the lies of Satan, to cut through the lies of the world, to cut through the lies of our own sinful nature, the the schemes of our own sinful hearts. We, We take God's Word and we fearlessly, as Paul says, make known its truths to ourselves and to others. And Paul has said previously that we have to speak the truth in love. And prayer is the strategy by which we tap into God's power. Through prayer, we find God's wisdom, we find God's discernment, we find God's strength for us to face the challenges and temptations that come with standing against sin. And here's the thing, that this battle was never meant to be something that we do alone. We aren't lone soldiers. We're not mercenaries. We're not hired mercenaries. Sort of, you know, God says, hey, look, here's your weapon for today. Go out and fight. Um, We aren't lone soldiers. See, Paul is is talking about a Roman soldier, a Roman soldier who's in a legion of other soldiers. We're not lone soldiers facing Satan or facing sin. We actually are part of an army. We have other soldiers. We have brothers and sisters in arms who fight with us and for us. See, Paul says, pray for yourselves on all occasions, but also keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray for others. Pray for each other. Pray that the mystery of the gospel be, would be fearlessly made known in your life and in their lives and through them in the lives of others. Pray that we would together know the love of God better. Pray that we would speak the truth of love, truth in love to each other. And, and, and Paul says, look, I'm going to send you someone. I'm going to send you a brother. He's going to encourage you. He's going to bring to you a greeting of peace and love and faith and grace. He's going to preach the gospel to you through his presence, the message of the gospel that's spoken and prayed and applied with each other, that helps each other on put on the full armor of God. That's our strategy for success. All right, last point. To stand strong in God, we have to discern our struggle. We have to put on strength. We need to follow the strategy. And finally, we need to rest in the Savior. Now, every image that Paul has used about this armor and, you know, the belt and all of these things and the breastplate um, is actually borrowed from the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, we are shown that God is actually the divine warrior. God and his Messiah is the divine warrior that goes out and fights for his people. I'm going to give you just one example from the book of Isaiah. There's many examples, especially in the book of Isaiah, but just one example from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 59. He, God, so that there was no one. God was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So God's own arm achieved salvation for him and God's own righteousness sustained him. God put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal in a cloak. It's God himself. God himself puts on the breastplate of righteousness. God himself puts on the helmet. God. This is the armor of of God. This is not the armor of God just in the sense of, hey, here's God's armor, whoop, we're just going to sort of give it to you, off you go. This is God putting on His own armor. In other words, when we put on the armor of God, we are putting on God Himself. God Himself is our armor. God Himself is the warrior who goes out before us. Putting on God's armor is about resting in a Savior who fights for us, who fights with us, and who has secured our victory through putting his own life on the line to save his people. 
Christ has secured our victory over sin and Satan in his death and resurrection. And he did it not by telling us to be better, not by telling us to sort of like, you know, strap our boots on tightly. He, he, not through political revolutions as well when he came. He didn't, do it, he didn't do it by solving, you know, social justice issues, although he did do that too. But ultimately he did it by dealing with our greatest problem, which is our condemnation as sinners. And that's the greatest lie of the devil, that we are condemned. That even if you have Jesus, you are condemned. Uh, the, the greatest scheme of Satan is for the gospel to never reach so deep into our hearts that we can live with the full understanding that we are no longer condemned, but we have a freedom in Jesus by the Spirit to live a new life because we are adopted as His children. So Paul says, put on the armor of God. Don't fall for the devil's schemes. Stand against his lies because you know your life has already been united to Jesus and the power of his resurrection is at work within you. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to just the end of this passage, we want to know that the power of the gospel is already at work within us. We want to put on your armor because we want to stand strong. We want to stand strong not on the basis of how good we are and how moral we are, but on the basis of your finished work of salvation achieved for us on the cross and sealed in your resurrection. But we want to fight the battles every single day. We want to be able to discern the lies of Satan Help us, Lord, to take this fight seriously and ultimately to always find rest in the fact that you are our saviour and our king and our warrior who has gone before us. Or if there are those among us who struggle with sin, who struggle to understand the gospel, who struggle to allow the gospel to seep really deep into uh, just the, the deepest parts of who we are and our identity. Help us as brothers and sisters to speak the truth in love to each other. To preach the gospel to each other, to pray for each other that the mystery of the gospel be fearlessly proclaimed in each of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.